Johnson was mostly interested in domestic politics, and especially the Great Society and the War on Poverty. However, the majority of his administration will end up being focused on the Cold War, and specifically Vietnam. During his administration, the United States will get involved in Vietnam. Uh, well, it will reach its crescendo, its highest point, and it will ruin his presidency. And the United States got involved in Vietnam not for economic reasons or for political, or for, not for economic reasons or strategic reasons, but for containment. Stop the spread of communism based on the domino theory. The idea that if Vietnam falls to communism, the rest of the countries in the region would fall to communism. Laos, Cambodia, Thailand, Malaysia, they would all fall like dominoes. So that is why the United States get, gets involved. And there's an important logical fallacy to understand that actually applies to the entire Cold War, but is really important for Vietnam. That is the either or or black or white fallacy. It's also called the false dilemma, false dichotomy, false binary. It is a logical fallacy that is founded on the premise that there are a limited number of alternatives, usually just two. You will experience this a lot with people that are very politically extreme. When people are really extreme, one side or the other, they will present everything as, oh, you're not on this side, then you are on that side. You're not on this side, you're not on that side. And that's just not how most things work, especially when you get into foreign policy and economics and things that are inherently complicated. And the example that is especially important for the Cold War in general and Vietnam is you are either democratic capitalist or you are socialist communist. And there is nothing in between. Because the history of Vietnam should have been taken more into consideration. So, start with a little background. Of, we'll start with the background of Vietnam before Johnson came into office, and then we'll talk about how Johnson escalated the war and uh, the outcomes and the consequences of Vietnam, because they are massive to this day. So the background that, in, that should have indicated that this was not a capitalist versus socialist communist was the fact that Vietnam was a colony of France since the 19th century, uh, 1800s. And it was part of, part of what's called French Indochina. That was Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia. And France controlled them until World War II when Japan took over. And then once World War II ended, the French came back in and took them back over and as if they were going to go right back to colonization. The problem is that there had already started an anti-colonial movement in Vietnam led by a guy named Ho Chi Minh. Now, the, a big part of the population of Vietnam wanted independence. They are not, they are not interested in Cold War politics of the U.S. or Soviet Union. Uh, Ho Chi Minh, his hero was George Washington. His, uh, he absolutely revered the American Revolution, because again, the American Revolution is anti-colonial movement. He even had like souvenirs from the American Revolution. So uh, the Declaration of Independence that uh, Vietnam writes, it is, has so much of it just taken directly from the U.S. Declaration of Independence. So that is the objective. And the first country Ho Chi Minh goes to for assistance is the United States. Now the United States is allies with France, so the United States would not help uh, 
Ho Chi Minh. As happens over and over again, once Ho Chi Minh could not get assistance from the United States, he then went to the other world superpower, the Soviet Union. And when he did that, all of a sudden, the United States got very interested in Vietnam. Now all of a sudden to the United States, it was a part of the Cold War. It was an issue of spreading communism. So the United States will see this as just uh, another plot by the Soviet Union to spread communism. But again, to a lot of people in Vietnam, it was anti-colonialism. But the United States will fund uh, France in trying to maintain control of uh, Vietnam. The United States pays for about 80% of all military expenditures for France, and France will fight a, against the revolutionary movement led by Ho Chi Minh for a few years before being utterly defeated at a place called Diem Bien Phu, uh, which leads them to have to negotiate. So negotiations were already underway, but the French, French being just overwhelmingly defeated means that they had to negotiate, which will happen at a place called Geneva in Switzerland. At the Geneva Accords, three agreements were worked out. First, the French gave up claims to Indochina. So the French, they're out of there. Second, Vietnam will be divided into a north and the south and divided at the 17th parallel, kind of like, just like with Korea. And third, there were going to be free, fair, and internationally supervised elections to unite the country two years after the Geneva, Conven Geneva Convention or Geneva Accords in 1956. So it was agreed on there would be uh, fair elections, and the country would be united. Now, North Vietnam, that was led by Ho Chi Minh, was completely united. And part of the reason was because uh, Ho Chi Minh killed anyone that opposed him. He executed uh, the class enemies. So, It would be a mistake to argue Ho Chi Minh was a good guy. But the North was united. The South was incredibly divided because it was under the control of this guy right here, Diem. The government in the South, led by Diem, was totally funded by the United States. And Diem was a, a Catholic, and he puts all Catholics in leadership positions in a country that is predominantly Buddhist. And so he does not represent the majority of the population. And there, of course, were a big part of the population in all colonial countries, in all countries that are col uh, uh, colonized. There were, the way the colonized country would do it is they would get a part of the population and uh, get them to support them and, you know, put them in leadership roles. And so DM did not represent the people in South Vietnam, and he was just very, very unpopular. He was so unpopular that in 1955, it became very obvious that he would not win. If elections, well, elections were supposed to be held in 1956, and he was going to lose. So he just called off the elections. He said, we're not gonna, I'm not gonna do the election in 1956, but I'm going to hold uh, our own, or we're gonna hold our own national elections in South Vietnam. And of course his government oversaw it and he gave himself 98.2% of the vote. Now, even the US CIA, even the American CIA was like, look, if you're gonna cheat on an election, make it like somewhat reasonable. Uh, he gave himself 98.2%. There's no one that believed that. Absolutely no one. Everyone recognized 
that it was a fraudulent election and he now set himself up to be ruler of the new Republic of Vietnam. So South Vietnam is now the Republic of Vietnam and now he is in charge. Now, this obviously did not sit well with a big part of the population in South Vietnam. And the part of the people in South Vietnam that were very much against it, that were against this, what they called a puppet government of the United States, which the United States is providing all the funding to bolster DM's government, so kind of was, called themselves the National Liberation Front, or uh, the Viet Cong. Viet Cong, uh, military letters, VC, Victor Charlie, that is where you get the phrase Charlie. If you've seen Forrest Gump, we're always searching for this guy Charlie. That's where it comes from. National Liberation Front, this is a, this is the Southern Vietnamese that will be fighting against the United States and launching a guerrilla war in order to oust the DM government. They got their funding from North Vietnam and Ho Chi Minh's government and from the Soviet Union. So the Soviet Union, North Vietnam are providing funding for the Viet Cong and the United States is providing first just money and then money and military supplies and then also economic advisors to South Vietnam and to Diem's government by the 1950s. So by Eisenhower's administration, the United States is providing money, military supplies, and it actually has military officers that are providing um, military advisor, advice on how to run the military. So the United States is getting very heavily involved. Now, this, uh, the problem, we'll come back to this later, but the problem is, what's the difference between a South Vietnamese person, or just South Vietnamese civilian and a uh, Viet Cong? You can't tell the difference. And that is really important to remember. We'll come back to that. So remember, the North Vietnam, they had an organized army. South Vietnam, though, it was just anyone that was against the DM government. And so it was just, they considered themselves an anti-colonial movement. And they were trying to get rid of the government that did not represent the majority of the population. So what the United States is trying to do here, the objective is nation building. And this is really important to understand. The United States is in Vietnam trying to put a government in South Vietnam that is non-communist, friendly to the United States, is going to be democratic, and uh, it is nation building is very, very difficult. The United States is trying to put in a government on the population that is going, the government will be friendly to the United States. And the, there's an inherent contradiction. And this will happen, this happens in several other places, especially in Central and South America. The United States is trying to create a government that is democratic and capitalistic, but it does not represent the will of the majority of the population. So it cannot be democratic. So that is a problem because DM's government was wildly unpopular. And this is not my opinion. I've gotten students very angry saying, uh, I, my family is from Vietnam and DM's government was fantastic. This is from the US CIA. The CIA was very critical of Diem's government because Diem's government was incredibly corrupt. He put family members in charge of important positions uh, and his brother was wildly unpopular, but his wife, oh my gosh, she was really unpopular. Madame Nu, uh, the 
people in South Vietnam disliked them so much that they were they, uh, to protests. Buddhist monks actually set themselves on fire in major cities. And then Madame Nu actually referred to them as Buddhist barbecues uh, and, you know, made fun of them. And the majority of the population is Buddhists. You know, the leadership, the leadership in the country is Catholic. It was wildly, wildly unpopular. And Diem's government was corrupt. The United States was providing them with tons of money. And what they're supposed to do with the money is build up the South. That's the that's the point. Win the hearts and minds. You build schools, you build roads, you make people's lives better so they can see how great capitalism is. But DM's government didn't do that. DM's government instead used the money uh, to enrich themselves. It's, it was a very corrupt system, but colonial governments are, in general, they have a long history of being very corrupt. So it got to the point that the United States CIA was so sick of DM. Again, so CIA words that they made it very clear to the South Vietnamese army that they were okay with Diem being taken out. So the US CIA contacted heads of the military and let it be known that they were okay with the military getting rid of Diem. So the military did that. 1963. Diem was thrown into the back of a van and he was assassinated. Now, this is what the United this is what Johnson comes into. When Johnson comes into office, Diem has just been assassinated, and the whole situation of Vietnam was in complete chaos. So now Johnson had to decide what he was going to do. So South Vietnam was in complete chaos. Johnson had to decide what he was going to do. And he will decide that he is going to get tough on the Vietnamese, or get tough on communism, and show strength. And uh, he was just insanely, I told you before, he was a very insecure person. And especially when it came to Vietnam, his insecurities really, really came out. Um, he, he will just go all in for Vietnam and it is what will ruin his presidency. Now, when I say Johnson was insecure, um, he, one of the most terror, one of the most telling stories about Andrew Johnson, uh, he was known to be well endowed, to put it mildly. And at one point on his ranch in Texas, a journalist just kept asking, why are we in Vietnam? Why are we in Vietnam? What are we doing there? Why are we there? And true story, he unzipped his pants, pulled out his Johnson, and said, this is why. That is Andrew Johnson. It was such an insecurity that he will just come, go all in on Vietnam. And... His advisors told him, if we're going to stabilize this country, we need to have troops. So, under his administration, they will write up a request from Congress to allow the president to have troops, uh, an unlimited amount of U.S. military forces in South Vietnam. But they didn't have a reason. And so, they wrote up the request to to Congress, and they let it sit on the desk until they could find a reason. If you took the first half of U.S. history, this is kind of like what happened in the Mexican-American War. James, P James K. Polk wrote up a request for war from Congress and then just waited for the reason to come. So he started with the request and then waited to find it, and that 
request came, the opportunity came at Gulf of Tonkin. The U.S. had a spy ship called the Maddox that was sailing through the Gulf of Tonkin, and uh, supposedly it was fired upon. Now, uh, overwhelming evidence now says that was not true, but the Maddox sent messages back to its base saying we've been fired upon, and Johnson will use that as the excuse for using military force. He then goes to Congress and says the United States has been attacked by North Vietnam and Congress will respond with the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution in 1964. The Gulf of Tonkin Resolution says that the president can use military force to protect South Vietnam against communism uh, using whatever means necessary. So it gave Johnson the right for a full-scale war without Congress actually declaring war. So now Johnson is free to use military force as he sees fit. This is the closest, so it wasn't actually a declaration of war, but Gulf of Tonkin is the closest the U.S. will get, but it gives him carte blanche to go all in, and he goes all in in two major ways. First, bombing. Vietnam is always known for the sheer amount of bombs that were dropped. Operation Rolling Thunder, the U.S. came in and it just bombed the living hell out of North Vietnam, South Vietnam. It just bombed everywhere. Uh, there, to this day, there are places in Vietnam that look like the moon because of the craters that it left. Uh, the United States will drop three times as many bombs in Vietnam as, as it did in all of World War II. In the span of two years, 1965 and 66, it drops more bombs than in the four years of World War II combined. It is amazing how much, how, how many bombs, but a lot of Vietnam is forest, so uh, it had mixed success, depending on where it was, but obviously they can't see what they're bombing. The other way the steps up U.S. involvement is by U.S. ground forces. Under Johnson, U.S. ground forces will just explode. Uh, when he came into office, there was about 16,000 military advisors, and from 1964, when the Gulf of Tonkin resolutions passed, to 1967, three years later, the number will increase to almost uh, 500,000. By 1968, the height, there was almost 600,000 Americans serving in Vietnam. Now, over the course of Vietnam, about 2.8 million Americans will serve and it will require the draft. Of those, uh, of the 2.8 million Americans that served, 80% of them did not want to and were drafted. So 2.2 million of the 2.8 million were drafted. So uh, people are going there obviously against their will. And the average age of the soldier in Vietnam was 19 years old. At first, there were exemptions for college students and for people with families, but the exemptions very quickly went away. So exemptions were called away really quick. Uh, one, of my, uh, one of my professors, he had just finished his PhD. In 1967, he had just finished his PhD. He had just gotten a full-time uh, position at UNT. He had one child and his wife was pregnant with the second child and he was drafted. It tells you they are not exempting anyone. Someone with a PhD, full-time job teaching history with one child already and another child on the way and he was drafted. So uh, they were not making exemptions for people with degrees, people with careers, people with families. Uh, they were bringing everyone. Not going to go into the details of the fighting, but something that is really important to understand in, in terms of the fighting that took place. 
in terms of the um, type of fighting, it is what is called a counterinsurgency, also known as COIN. Uh, if the term sounds familiar, either you took the first half of U.S. history with me or you uh, know that this is what the United States used in Iraq and Afghanistan. The person who came up with the blueprint for counterinsurgency, David Petraeus, he was in charge of the military operations in Iraq and Afghanistan. A counterinsurgency is trying to put down an internal rebellion. So you are trying to find a part of the population that is in rebellion against the government. Now, let me give you a description of what this looked like. You had the world superpower that was trying to find uh, anti-colonial rebellion in the country. That anti-colonial rebellion is being funded by the enemy of the world superpower. Now, in counterinsurgencies, counter you're not just trying to take over land like in you know, World War II, for example. So uh, the objective isn't to control land because the, the United States, it controlled all of South Vietnam. Wherever it wanted to, it controlled. It had the military force. So there would be battles that lasted like two months to take a hill. The U.S. would be fighting the uh, Viet Cong for like two months to take a hill and then they'd take it and then they would just leave because they're not trying to get that hill. What they're trying to do is weed out the insurgents. So they're trying to weed out the rebels. They're trying to find the rebels. That is the object objective is to find the insurgents, find the rebels from a population that looks exactly the same. So they're trying to weed out rebels from a population to protect the rest of the population and there is not, you know, defining uniforms. So counterinsurgencies are very confusing. The United States will win the overwhelming majority of battles. In fact, it doesn't lose any of the battles. Every one of the battles that the United States engaged in, it won. It will just lose the war overall. And it's really important in a counterinsurgency, victory depends on the local population that you're trying to protect. So that local population that looks just like the uh, insurgents, victory depends on them creating a stable government. That is what, uh, that is why the objective is nation building, the type of war is a counterinsurgency. Now, everything I just said, all that description exactly defines what the British was, were doing in the United States during the American Revolution. And this is not an interpretation that was just, historians realized it years later. During the Vietnam War, especially British historians, British military historians love to point out that the objective is the same. You could switch out some words, but it is the same kind of war. Again, counterinsurgencies, they're, if you go through the history of world superpowers being defeated by third world countries because they're fighting counterinsurgencies, you have the American Revolution, uh, the United States in Vietnam, the United States in Iraq, the United States in Afghanistan, the Soviet Union in Afghanistan in the 1980s. There's just a ton of them. Counterinsurgencies are really, really difficult. So. You want to know the one of the biggest reasons the United States will lose is because of the type of fighting and the type of war. It is just a very, very difficult thing to win. Now, from the very beginning of Johnson's escalation, the Vietnam War was incredibly controversial. It's still controversial to this day. And in the United States, the country will divide into what are called hawks and doves. Hawks are people that supported the war, doves are people that opposed the war. And there were a lot of reasons that people, uh, there were a lot of reasons people opposed the war. And 
they are understandable. Most notably, there was a draft. So most people that were fighting did not want to be there. Uh, there it wasn't like World War II where there was, there was a draft in World War II, but in World War II, it's, the purpose, the reason for it is very obvious. Uh, for a lot of Americans though, the draft, it means uh, they had to serve without volunteering and for a war that they didn't understand and in a place that they didn't know anything about. Uh, majority of Americans, as late as like 1960, uh, 1967, could not identify where Vietnam was on a map. Uh, they usually point to Korea. So the draft made it so obviously this came really close to home. Also, the death rate. The death rate will skyrocket once the, oh, it should say casualty rate actually, because uh, once the United States really gets involved heavily, so in 19, uh, 64, the death rate was about 600 Americans. The next year it was 6,600, so 10 times as many. And over the course of the entire Vietnam War, there will be 58,000 deaths. Uh, that is the fourth highest uh, death rate of any war. And I've heard people say, well, compared to the Civil War, that's not a lot. And like, if you're a parent, does that make a difference to you? Uh, part of the reason that the death rate was actually only 58,000, and I say only, that is a lot, is because our health care, our medicine had gotten so good that a lot of people were able to be saved. So the people that were injured, and there were some very serious injuries, was more than 300,000. So you had 300,000 people that were seriously injured. Uh, but yeah, that's why the death rate wasn't higher is because they were able to stay alive, but obviously you had a lot of people that lost limbs, uh, lost legs, lost arms. So the death rate made a lot of people oppose the war. Also, this is the first televised war in U.S. history. So journalists were embedded in military units. Imagine you're a parent, you have a child that's been drafted, they're in Vietnam, just get done eating, dinner, you turn on the news and you're watching a journalist talk about what they're doing and all of a sudden bullets start flying, bombs start going off and there's a firefight and you know your child is over there. This brought the war into people's living room. This made it so people got to see what the war, not exactly what it was like, but it made it more human. So the fact that it was televised made people, uh, made a lot of people oppose it. And finally, the cost. Uh, Vietnam was, like all wars, very expensive. War is one of the most expensive things a nation can engage in. And that has been true for thousands and thousands of years. Going back to Sun Tzu's The Art of War, it is just a fact that wars are expensive. And the Vietnam War, of course, is no exception. The cost of the war was uh, exploded. And by the height of, at the height of the war, 1968, the United States will be spending $77 billion on Vietnam, on Vietnam. And over the course of the war, on average, it spends about $27 billion a year. This that is a sum that makes you know, the great society look like pennies when it was going on. Uh, so the cost of the war was absolutely astronomical. Just to give you an idea how expensive wars are in Iraq and Afghanistan, to keep one soldier in Iraq and Afghanistan for one year, it cost a million dollars per soldier. That is for housing, to bring food, gas, everything. So. That is, it's an insanely expensive thing to do. So there will be a lot of opposition to the war and opposition came from three big areas. And the one that everyone knows about, the most 
obvious were the hippies. Uh, obviously, college students, they're the ones being drafted, so they're the ones that it affects most. So the epicenter of the anti-war movement was, of course, on college campuses. Now, not all anti-war protesters were hippies, but all hippies were anti-war protesters. And that is the group that everyone associates with the protest movement, and it made up a big portion of them. Part of the, uh, again, big reason is because they're the ones that are going to be affected, but also because the civil rights movement, the tactics that they had used to fight for uh, civil rights, they would use for anti-war protesting. So those two things will merge. But, this is really important, it was not just hippies. It was not just college students. Another big part of the anti-war movement were parents. Parents whose children either had died or were over there, and the parents just did not think that their child's life was worth the Vietnam War. The parents that saw their kid, saw like on the news what was happening, the parents made up a uh, significant part of the anti-war movement but the most compelling anti-war protesters were the veterans. So veterans would go over to Vietnam and they would serve for uh, they would serve for a year and then they would have a year off and then they'd have to come back. And when the veterans came back, they would protest and they would say, no idea what we're doing over there. We're just walking through the country trying to find enemies who look just like the people that we're trying to protect. And so the protest by the veterans themselves was especially compelling for a lot of Americans and was very convincing, especially to a lot of middle-class Americans. So protests came from all sides. Now, we're not going to get into the, into the fighting or the actual battles except one. Throughout 1965, 1966, 1967, the generals and the political leaders in the Johnson administration kept saying, we are about to win. They kept saying the, the one line that if you ever hear means that things are about to, things are going to be really bad is we'll have the boys home by Christmas. Whenever anyone says that, it's... The Nazis said that before they invaded the Soviet Union. I mean, it's just every time that you hear that, you know, oh, this is going to be really long. Generals kept saying, we're about to win. We're about to win. We're about to win. And then, on January 30th, 1968, the Vietnamese holiday, the Tet holiday, it's the start of the uh, Lunar New Year in Vietnam, the South Vietnamese and the North Vietnamese launched a massive, massive offensive called the Tet Offensive. The Tet Offensive was a huge uprising by the Vietnamese, uh, by uh, Viet Cong, North Vietnamese, uh, at every major city in South Vietnam. Now, it was a massive attack, and overall, it was a failure. Some cities, it took a couple months for the U.S. to take back, but overall, the United States will take back every place that the Viet Cong attacks because, uh, yeah, the United States just did not lose battles. It had stronger fighting force, or better weapons, better technology, bombers. So the United States will take all of those places back. But what is really important is the Tet Offensive will convince most Americans of two things. One, they were being lied to. They kept being told, this is almost over, we're almost done, the war is almost over, just a little more. So they will, the Tet Offensive, Tet Offensive, convinces them that they are being lied to. And second, that the South Vietnamese will to fight was not diminishing. That no matter what the general said, South Vietnamese, they lose, like, they lose 
more than 40,000 soldiers. The United States, in that offensive, the United States loses somewhere like 1,100 to 1,200 soldiers. And the South Vietnamese, or the uh, Viet Cong and North Vietnamese will lose more than 40,000. So it's, it's very devastating for Ho Chi Minh and, and the Viet Cong, but it proved that they were still willing to fight. They had the will to fight. Especially when one of the most respected journalists of the time, a guy named Walter Cronkite, got on TV and said, it seems now more certain than ever that the bloody experience of Vietnam is to end in a stalemate. Most Americans were convinced, all right, this is just a quagmire. We are not going to win. So majority of Americans will oppose, will start opposing the war. Uh, and LBJ, who was always obsessed with looking at polling, he will read the numbers and he will realize, yeah, the majority of Americans are, are opposed to this. Uh, just for comparison, if you want to, the best comparison to the Tet Offensive is in the American Revolution, the Battle of Yorktown. George Washington captured uh, Lord Cornwallis at Yorktown and the British could have still, could have kept fighting still, but the majority of the population in England said, all right, we've had enough. So it was a political victory. LBJ, shortly after this, will come on national TV and announce that he is de-escalating in Vietnam. He announces he is de-escalating Vietnam and he ends his speech by saying, I will not seek and I will not accept the nomination, the Democratic nomination in the election of 1968. It absolutely stunned the nation. But so the United States will start de-escalating uh, after the Tet Offensive. So to summarize the Vietnam War, it used to be the longest war in American history, it went from 1955 to 1973, so uh, almost 19 years about, was the longest war until the war in Afghanistan, and it was America's first loss. It's the first time America lost in a war, unequivocally lost. Why did it lose? Now, an answer that you hear very frequently is because of the war protesters and uh, the media that turned Americans against it. Uh, that is a very simplified view of it. The reason the United States won, well, there's three big reasons. One is because it's a counterinsurgency. And so the idea that the United States just needed to put more effort in and just, if we had just pushed a little harder, pushed a little harder, that ignores one major fact of counterinsurgencies, which is victory depends on the local population. The United States can do everything it possibly can, but ultimately what is going to determine victory is the people in South Vietnam that are supporting the government of South Vietnam because it is supposed to create its own nation. So the United States could have uh, bolstered, bolstered up the South Vietnamese government forever as long as it stayed there forever. It was the exact same thing in the American Revolution. The British, uh, they could have kept the American Revolution going on forever. They just had to stay there forever and they couldn't afford it. Uh, but they depended on the loyalists. Same thing in Iraq and Afghanistan. Victory in those countries depended on the people in Iraq and the people in Afghanistan creating governments and creating a police force and creating a military. So the United States can put all the money and the time and effort it wants to, but ultimate victory depends on the people in the country. So there is inherently in counterinsurgencies a lack of control, 
uh, there is at some point the United States, whatever country is fighting the counterinsurgency, does not have control because it's dependent on the population there. So that's the first reason. Second reason, second major reason for the failure of the Vietnam War is actually from the military themselves. The generals, uh, after Vietnam, the US military looks inward. So they get very introspective and they will, several prominent generals will write books explaining that the biggest problem that they had in Vietnam was the US military started running itself like it was a business or a corporation. It started bringing people in that were from the business, from corporations to run the military like a business. And this is something that you hear in the United States quite a bit, like, well, we just need to run that like a business. We need to run colleges like a business, which they're not. We need to run the government like a business. It's not. We need to run the military like a business. It's not a business. Um, and what that, that meant a lot of things, but the biggest one was statistics. Victory, the evidence that the U.S. was succeeding was based on statistics, specifically what's called the body count. So they would count how many bodies they uh, of enemies they found, and they would rack up those numbers and be like, look how many people we killed, and this is proof that the U.S. is winning. So this really distorted the views of the generals and the political leadership um, for all sorts of reasons. Like, for example, uh, that's the objective is you want to have a lot of bodies. So like when soldiers went out to battle and they, you know, threw a grenade and then afterwards they big gunfight, uh, they would count the individual body pieces so they could get their body count number up. So whoever was in charge of the unit could get a promotion. So, you know, they'd be like, oh, here's a finger, that's one person. Here's a, another finger, that's another person. And here's a leg, that's another person. Uh, the Air Force, obviously, they were running or Operation uh, uh, Rolling Thunder to bomb. They were counting, they can't exactly count the number of dead because they're in planes when they bomb. So they would base their uh, death count on just as when they, when a plane went out, uh, it's called a sortie mission, or the sortie count or counting how many planes went out, that would count. So uh, there were a lot of examples of Air Force generals that would send out multiple planes with very limited amount of ammo because the objective was not to actually be effective. It was to send out as many planes as you can so you could drop bombs so you could get the body count up. Because again, if you were in the military, if you were the leader of a unit, then that is how you get promotions, is have a high body count. So from a lot of generals in the military, they will say the problem is we started running this. We were, we became a, the military looked for managers and not leaders. You, the idea that everything should be run as a business is just a bad idea. No matter how many times people say it, it is not good. So that is a second reason. A third reason the United States lost in Vietnam is because the Vietnamese wanted independence. They had the will to fight. They had the motivation to fight. They were fighting for independence. And again, if you think about it like the American Revolution and the American rebels that wanted independence, independence movements inherently have a level of motivation that the other side is not going to have. And so the Vietnamese just really wanted independence. So those are three big reasons the United States, this is the first loss in US history. 
Now, here's a question. Could the United States, well, let me, what is an alternative? Could the United States have survived without getting involved in Vietnam like this? And it is impossible to know, but the short answer is probably. For one, Ho Chi Minh first came to the United States. So had the United States you know, said to France, look, you guys, we're post-World War II. You, you need to get out there. If they want their independence, you need to like give, give them their country, whatever. Uh, Ho Chi Minh would have preferred support from the United States, from the Soviet Union, from the beginning. So that is just one little piece of evidence, but a more important piece of evidence that the United States could have survived had it allowed Vietnam to go communist was uh, today, Vietnam is America's ninth largest trading partner. And it is the same government that we fought so many years ago, but it is the ninth largest trading partner, second or uh, one step behind England. So it is, England is eighth, but it is eighth by a very little. So it's almost equal in trade. Vietnam is almost equal in trade to the United States as England. So we have economic ties, and more importantly, the United States has been launching military operations with Vietnam since 2010. The United States has been launching joint military operations, uh, especially one called RIMPAC, RIM of the Pacific. It is launching joint military operations with the Vietnamese Navy in the South China Sea because China is encroaching in their territory. So. It turns out the United States can get along with them just fine. So the Vietnam War, it has a lot of, there are a lot of tragedies that come from it, but one of the biggest long term, one of the biggest short and long term tragedies, and this is of the Johnson administration in general, is the economics. The cost of the Vietnam War was massive wasn't obviously as big as the war in uh, or World War II, but wars are just very, very expensive. The amount of money spent on Vietnam was just significantly more than all of the great society at the time. So the great society will become more expensive over time, but when Vietnam was going on, it was just an insanely expensive war. And Without going into any of the details, Johnson will handle the war economically really, really bad because he wants to have both the Great Society and Vietnam. And so he will maneuver the US economy in a way that is very complicated, but will lead to the end of the golden age of capitalism. The golden age of capitalism is said to go from about 1946 to 1973. And there's a reason it goes until 1973. That is the end of the Vietnam War. Vietnam, Vietnam will help lead to the end of the golden age of capitalism in the short run. And it will be a major factor in the massive inflation of the 1970s. So in the short term, Vietnam, it is responsible for the U.S. economy just going really, really bad. The Johnson administration, uh, in the long term, I should say, in the long term, the Vietnam War, uh, we have not actually experienced the height of spending. So one of the most expensive things about wars is veterans. Uh, as of two... In 2016, the United States was still paying veterans benefits from the Civil War. That is 150 years earlier. Wars are just expensive and you have to pay, uh, well not have to, it is America's responsibility to provide for the veterans that were injured and disabled and their family or the families that lost uh, 
soldiers. So that is the expense that people do not take into consideration. And it is a massive, massive expense. World War II veterans didn't, uh, veteran benefits from World War II didn't peak until 1991. And at that time it was uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of five, uh, $5 billion a year. The Vietnam War had an insane amount of injured, and we have yet to experience, it takes about 50 years for it to reach the peak of how much money is going to veterans, and we have yet to reach that peak yet. So the amount of money that is going to be uh, go towards helping veterans is only going to get greater and greater and that is if we were not including the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, which again, war in Afghanistan is the longest war in U.S. history, and those wars, we will be paying benefits, we should be paying benefits for veterans, and will have to be for more than a century now. And if you know anything about veterans affairs, you know a veteran, you know that uh, they still are not being provided enough. Veterans have the highest rates of unemployment, highest rates of homelessness, highest rates of suicide, and even for the huge amounts that they're getting, it is not enough. So I'm not at all arguing they should not get it because they 100% should. I'm not even arguing for any policies. It is just a fact that wars, one of the biggest expenses is the long-term expenses. And we have yet to feel those for Vietnam even. And they're just gonna get bigger and bigger because Iraq and Afghanistan as well. And finally, for Lyndon Johnson's presidency overall, the Vietnam War will be the most expensive thing uh, compared to compared to the uh, Great Society. But long term, the Great Society will be more expensive. And it is specifically because of the healthcare cost. So the most, most expensive part of the US government is healthcare. Medicare and Medicaid combined. And again, that's because there is no cap put on healthcare or the procedures. Between Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security, that is just the overwhelming majority of US expenditures. That little other ring of mandatory outlays, uh, 1.502 billion, that is, a lot of that is spending on veterans. Vast majority of the US economy, that outer ring that's mandatory, that is Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, uh, the other parts of Social Security, unemployment, and um, veterans. And it is the overwhelming majority of the US budget. So when People say that the Great Society led to the massive economic problems. They are correct, but they are usually, most people talk about it like it's the food stamp program, which we didn't talk about, but uh, it is not. It is the other parts of the federal budget. Federal budget is one of those things that people have very, very strong opinions about without looking at it, but we have the numbers, you can look at the data. And the data is unequivocal. Uh, the United States debt is in insanely high levels, dangerous levels, and it is not for the little programs that people tend to focus on. It is those big programs, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, uh, and this is not to suggest, I'm not making any suggestions, it is just the reality of where our debt comes from. So Johnson's administration will leave a lasting negative 
Mark in a lot of ways. 